Welcome to a very unscripted version of Anglican, Unscripted, episode 626. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today is October 23rd, 2020. All right, welcome to the program. Before we get started, obviously, like the program, give us a thumbs up. This isn't Cisco and Ebert. You can't give us two thumbs up, but, uh, well, you could. If you went to Facebook and YouTube, you could click the thumbs up on both. Subscribe to the program if you're not subscribed yet. You do that on YouTube. Uh, leave comments. You guys are the best comment leavers. Leavers. Leavers? Commenters ever and uh, uh, we really appreciate you taking time to let us know you watch the program and your thoughts on the topics we've been talking about it's really important this is a very unscripted unscripted uh, George and I only had a couple minutes to do pre-show I have to haul the RV out of the current park we're re relocating to a new location today and uh, Ranger Rick's gonna be here in about uh, an hour making sure this place is empty so I got to do a show and and haul up all within the hour so we, I don't want to seem rushed I, I do want us to talk about the topics, but George and I have not had a good time to talk about this pre-show. So this this is kind of like the pre-show. Yeah. And if you've been paying any attention to Christian news or religious news over the last uh, 48 hours, uh, you would say all hell has broken loose in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Christian Church, in the Evangelical Church. It's just crazy out there. And this this is an exclamation point on 2020, of course. Wouldn't it be cool if Jesus came really, really soon just to, to redeem 2020 in some way, shape, or form? But uh, we'll have to see that. We're going to save uh, Pope Francis for the last story. Before we get to that, um, we have a rescheduled Lambeth 2020 has been scheduled to Lambeth 2022, The Journey. Uh, what's the story there, George? The uh, Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lambeth Corporation, which is the holding company they formed to uh, run the Lambeth Com Conference, has announced dates for July in 2022, two years out. And they've also given a rough uh, idea of what it'll look like. And they have morphed the Lambeth Conference into a gathering of bishops for mutual aid council and uh, discussion of the, the great issues of the day into an extended graduate school conference slash clergy training event. So uh, we had our Diocese of Central Florida clergy conference where we had these earnest speakers come and tell us how to be nice to uh, Welsh lesbian trade unionists in, in wheelchairs, how to welcome them into our church and, you know, taught by people who have no actual success in building churches, who have no actual <laughs> pastoral ministry to speak of, we're told how, how to fix the world by the experts from the head office. Uh, that's what's going to happen at Lambeth 2020. So we're going to have English academics tell African evangelicals how to grow their church. Uh, we're going to have uh, classes on safeguarding. In other words, all the things that the Church of England is a f utter fiasco at. Failure. Church growth, safeguarding, <laughs> media relations, all the stuff that they do really, really poorly. We're going to have these earnest... Uh, I, the image that comes to my mind are these blue bottle flies that buzz around... Uh, the dead animals that we have yeah, here. Right. Kevin, when you get Buzzard. to Florida, you'll see the armadillos <laughs> no. and the deers and the coyotes lying by the roadside who got hit in the night and they're all covered with the blue bottle flies. Well, the blue bottles will be at Lambeth 2022 telling people, uh, telling their betters how to do a better job. That's right. I mean, it, it is sad at this point. It, the Church of England is in utter failure. Um, in the last dozen years have shown that every innovation they have tried has failed and they would love to bring those innovations to the anglican communion as a whole and, and in large part they're doing so well and now to be fair they're not all english they have some canadians That's um true. the chairman yes. of the conference is tabo makoba the head of the Ar C diocese of cape town mm -hmm. and south africa is one of the few if probably the only african province that's in rapid decline 
that has a massive corruption problem that is in bed with the African National Congress government uh, on most levels. So in other words, the, the one uh, unrepresentative African archbishop is the, of course, the token archbishop in charge of the, uh, the show. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's like saying Josiah Dabu Ferron, the uh, general secretary of the Anglican Consultative Council, it's like claiming he is representative of Church of Nigeria opinion. Well, I don't think so. Uh, I remember when I was at the last Lambeth and I was hanging out with, I would call a liberal reporter from the BBC, and we're in the press uh, area doing our stuff, and I had just gotten there. And I've never been to a Lambeth. I'm fresh out of America. And he goes, you want to go see a circus? What? He says, come on, come on, come on, come on. And mind you, he's on their side. And he takes me to the exposition, exhibition hall, or where they have all the books and all the reading and stuff and all the, uh, uh, the wares you can buy, sell, and pins and stuff like that and all the uh, um, people who are there to be activists have their tables. And it really was a circus of all these colors and ideas and fluffiness and um, people dressed in, in strange costumes and uh, two or three wearing drag. It just, it, it is what it is, okay? And I'm like, to the BBC guy, you support this? No, but it's good news. Okay. Well, I get you. It is employment. You know, you and I as Anglican reporters will have employment in the Anglican news industry forever. That applies to Roman Catholic reporters now, too. But we're not going to get there because we do need to move into some serious news. Lambeth isn't. Uh, we do have some new archbishops, George. Uh, Hong Kong and Singapore? Well, Singapore, Titus Chung is the new bishop. He's not oh, the archbishop of okay, the right. province. But Titus Chung is a great addition to the uh, Global South uh, GAFCON fold. Um, I think he's the former dean of the St. George's Cathedral there, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But that's somebody who I expect to see is to be a uh, voice in the future deliberations of the wider communion. The new uh, uh, Archbishop of Hong Kong, of the province, I believe is Andrew Chan. I, I'll need to look that up. But uh, he is a, a very different from his predecessor, uh, Paul Kwong, uh, um, in that the, the current man is a tool of the Communist Party in Peking. Mm -hmm. He is a member of government bodies. He says, we have nothing to fear from martial law, obey the security forces, let's be good Chinese first and Christian second. The uh, new archbishop, who is uh, remains the bishop of Eastern Kowloon, uh, Hong Kong is three divisions, East Kowloon, yes. West Kowloon, Hong yeah. Kong Island, and the missionary district of Macau, uh, he has penned letters supporting a democratic protest, but he's also penned letters denouncing violence. And they've basically elected someone who is going to consciously be apolitical. He's going to try to find a way not to ape. Uh, I'm reading his mind now. Okay. I was going to say, I have not, he has not written this down anywhere. But from what we can tell. I am reading his <laughs> mind. And the waves the I am getting, <laughs> based on past practices, my supposition is that he's going to find a way to maintain the independence and integrity of the church by avoiding paths of direct confrontation. Mm -hmm. We have Cardinal Zen, the former Archbishop of Hong Kong, the Roman Catholic Archbishop, who is in direct confrontation with the Hong sure. Kong Church. Yeah. And then, and as are some uh, Protestant leaders. And then we have some leaders like the former Archbishop Anglican of Hong Kong, who are totally in bed with the communists. And then the others are like, well, let's try to find a way not to upset our political masters, while at the same time be faithful Christians. So. He's going to have a really tough job. Well, he is, because we're just years away from China making him a, a bunch of martyrs. Mm -hmm. And they have no trouble making political martyrs. Are they, are they willing to uh, visually uh, make uh, Christian martyrs? And I would, I would keep this new archbishop in your prayers, because uh, it is a hard 
road to be in the middle line between evil and good? The things that we're seeing out of China by some of the Chinese expatriate mm-hmm. ministry groups, because uh, they can't say this if they're in China, <laughs> but you know, in, in northern China, the local communist uh, the government leaders have said, no children may attain church. Everybody going in church into a church has to be photographed or filmed, and you have to be identified as a Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't have this job if you're a Christian. You can't. Uh, get, you can't go to university if you're Christian. Uh, you cannot, in other words, the, the, in some parts are more active. Uh, crosses are being taken down from churches, uh, external crosses, uh, inside churches, uh, pictures of the new, uh, of the Communist Party uh, General Secretary Xi are be- replacing pictures of Jesus and Moses and the saints. Uh, the Ten Commandments were, have been withdrawn in many Chinese churches because the government finds them offensive because the first commandment is not love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's love and obey the party Absolutely. with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength. Hmm. That has not hit Hong Kong yet, but the government in Peking has made it cl- very clear that they want Hong Kong to be indistinguishable uh, socially and politically from the rest of China but preserve its economic powerhouse to provide cash for the Chinese economy. Now, how the government's going to manage that, I don't know, and how the Christians in Hong Kong are going to be able to square the circle, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. Okay, let's move on to Pope Francis news. And before we get too far, we need to really identify that Pope Francis is allowed to have, allowed to have a personal opinion. He can say things and it doesn't instantly become dogma. Um, Which is really important to me as a capitalist. Last week, he or two weeks ago, he wrote the Tutti Frutti paper, uh, you know, throwing out capitalism and saying it was an evil economy and it was no way to run a country. And uh, that to me is more concerning than what he just said with the uh, uh, same sex issue. But uh, Pope Francis, in an interview for a documentary, said, uh, and I'm summarizing here, same-sex people need to be able to have a family and summarizing again the best way to do that is to offer them civil unions and we don't want them to be unhappy or thrown out uh kevin you and i have had children yep and have you ever experienced christmas day afternoon (laughs) the morning their children are excited uh joyous they have all their new toys and they've played with them all and they're bored at two o'clock and they play in the boxes yes <laughs> they're not happy anymore <laughs> uh the pursuit of happiness uh it may be an american political ideal but it is not a gospel imperative um first let where do we start with francis well this is not new in the sense that when francis was archbishop in argentina he supported the government's plan to introduce civil same-sex unions, partnerships. Mm -hmm. So he's not changed his mind there. He's kicked upstairs to the Vatican, and he has said some stuff in informal statements that uh, continue this line of thinking. But at the same time, he's uh, cracked down on homosexuality in seminaries and things of that nature. So he's giving mixed messages. Uh, where's the sort of base level? John Paul II and Benedict have spoken clearly and succinctly on same-sex civil unions, saying the church cannot bless behavior that they believe and see, according to Christian, unchanging Christian teaching, is morally uh, reprehensible. Homosexual acts are contrary to God's divine law and contrary to nature. The Church of Cat- the Roman Catholic Church has taught as have most Christian churches, uh, even the Episcopal Church, up, <laughs> At until, one point. A point, <laughs> yes. up to a certain point. Hmm. Francis is now saying we can suspend that in favor of a pastoral approach. So we're not going to, so it's, I it's, see, this is, well, 10 things I want to say, but let me tie it back into Anglicanism because it's not my job to both 
to to bash the Catholics. They there are plenty of people doing that to Francis. Right. You know, and, or or defend them, bash them. But we're just giving the news as an Anglican sphere here. And mine, our news is Kevin, and I think you can uh, illustrate this or push this even further. Is we've been there, we've done that. Sure. We have been through well. Yes, the Bible teaches this. Yes, church tradition is there. But we need to find a pastoral accommodation. So we're not going to change things. We're just going to change how we do this. And Francis has wants to introduce the pastoral option, which is how the Episcopal Church was one of the steps on its road to, as the living, as the Episcopal News Service says, to the complete collapse expected by the year 2050. Uh, you know, we've been here. If, I think, Kevin, you sent me an email uh, with cl a topic saying Francis the Anglican. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if the Anglican community wanted to hire a director of marketing uh, and Pope Francis was that guy, you got it. I mean, this is, this is great for the uh, people who don't want to be Roman Catholic Church or looking for an alternative uh, or think the Roman Catholic Church was the best bet in town. You and I have talked many times. Uh, there is no perfect denomination. There is no uh, perfect church. The Orthodox are out there. Oh, we've never divided. Uh huh. Check your history again. You know, I just like it. Uh, it, it just it, it's ridiculous to think that there's a perfect denomination out there, and, and there's not because they're all led by humans, and humans are full of failures. Um, and this is a perfect example of a person who says, I have to be able to make people happy. It's a gospel imperative to be happy. And global happiness is as new as democracy, George. Um, there's been extreme poverty in this world uh, since day one for the 15,000 years up until maybe uh, 320, 330 years ago. Uh, where we started to see some uh, industrial economies start to take up beyond agriculture, so you weren't completely wiped out in drought. And, you know, th there was a time where there could be something attainable of joy and happiness other than what we see uh, in th this hedonist society now. But, George, I, well, if, the, if but that's your goal, if, if your goal is happiness, you're going to sink this church. Yeah, and, and Francis has said some, what I'll call some screwy things in the past few weeks that would make, would if I were a Roman Catholic, which I'm not, I don't think will ever be, uh, would cause me great concern. One, he's basically said that the, the economic model that has lifted people out of poverty uh, for the first time in history, mm -hmm. uh, ha that has created unprecedented wealth, the actual, the... global uh, level of poverty have been falling rapidly, not because of government intervention, not because of handouts, not because of anything like that, but because of the market economy. And people are lifted out of poverty. A rising tide lifts all boats. Yes, we now have billionaires the way we used to have millionaires, but we don't have uh, the massive poverty that we once had. There's still poverty. Mm -hmm. I see it every day in my work. Sure. But I deal with people who uh, need, you know, come bring food, and they're driving up in their car with a cell phone, and they want food. Now, a hundred years ago, when we had poverty, or fifty years ago, or twenty-five years ago, it's relative. A cell phone is a necessity. A big screen TV is a necessity. A car is a necessity, and we'll still go to the food bank. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the thing. Second, he has thrown out the whole basis of the peaceful international order that has reigned since the Second World War, more or less, yeah. which is the just war theory, that the military is, can be used for moral good purposes, that nations have a right to defend themselves, that there can be peace through strength. Um, Francis has uh, tossed aside that 1500 years of just war theory in the church. And now Francis again has tossed aside the uh, traditional church understanding of family, of the purpose of sexual intimacy, 
all the stuff that uh, John Paul did about the family and the body and sexuality and all the stuff that Cardinal Ratzinger has been pushing about, Francis says, well, that's nice, but we still want people to be happy and we're not going to pay any attention to what we have taught for the last 2,000 years. Now, of course, there are people over the moon about this. Uh, but And then I get... I subscribe to the various denominational news services. So the Southern Baptists had a press release and the Southern Baptists, I think ever since John F. Kennedy, have not been going hammer and tong against the Catholics being the whore, no. Pope being the whore of Babylon. I mean, no, that hasn't we're come in up the modern recently. era. <laughs> and they hardly never talk about the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. They're talking about the Catholic Church again, teaching false doctrine. Uh, we're back to the good old days again. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the Orthodox are going bananas. And the Episcopal Church and the Methodists and the Lutherans are saying, oh, well, Francis, you finally see the light. You, you are affirming us. You know, oh, I know. But, but here's the reality. The Roman Catholic Church, and the, once again, this isn't dogma. This is just the Pope's opinion. But if he gets to appoint the cardinals and he gets to uh, set up shop with uh, his appointees in leadership... The Roman Catholic Church will end up like the failed Episcopal Church, like the failed Church of England, like the failed National Lutheran Church. Um, there, there's no place that offered happiness to their congregations that is surviving. And I've, you know, I've been I've been in this business long enough to know that if you preach to make people happy, if you preach to be popular, if you preach or, or set your way you operate your church in order to gain the acclaim of the crowd. Uh, you may be popular today, but tomorrow you'll be yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. The church is here to teach the unchanging world, word of Jesus Christ, and to honor Jesus, to worship the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to serve our neighbor and serve our neighbor. It's not here to be a, an agent of the spirit of the world. See, this is, this is, I think, the theme that we've been hitting the Church of England and the Episcopal Church and the other mainstream Protestant churches of being, of being a, a creature of the spirit of the age, uh, of trying to be the church of what's happening now. Um, there used to be an English uh, writer, uh, he would write on the Telegraph, named Peter Simple. Yeah. And uh, he had this uh, caricature of a bishop, uh, oh, I've forgotten his name, Sp uh, Whatever he, he was, the uh, he had this sort of caricature of a bishop who was very modern and trendy, and in the seventies and eighties, that was hysterically funny because it was so ludicrous. Well, that, now that's the norm. <laughs> you can no longer write. Peter Simple, uh, Simple, if he were still alive and working with us, working could not write what he's doing today because it could not be distinguished from the news. Bishop of Bev Bevington. Was the go-getting Bishop of Bevington. Bevington that's right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank God for it, Google. <laughs> you know, the go-getting Bishop of Bevington could could be the Bishop of Leeds today, or the Bishop of Buckingham, or the Bishop of Manchester, or the Bishop of Newark, or the Bishop of Atlanta, or the Bishop of Rhode Island. I mean, it's hard to tell. This, it, it's no longer easily, you're no longer easily able to distinguish between humor and satire and sarcasm and reality well that's just it i mean 2020 satire has become real fiction 1984 a fictional book needs to be put into the nonfiction section now you know it, it everything has just gone absolutely crazy but talking about allowing two people to have um legal protections is fine uh my wife is a twin and if she wanted to set up a business with her twin she should have legal protections available to her by the government um it doesn't have to be done on the same sex level two people should be able to have tax benefits afforded to them legal benefits afforded to them um and the problem is the tax system the problem is the legal system you don't have to make extraordinary uh, systems like civil unions or extraordinary marriages uh, to accomplish this. You need to change the old ways we've been trying to 
uh, take the wealth from people for such a long time. Uh, if two sisters own a house, one dies, to pay the taxes, they have to sell the house. If they were, if a husband and wife had the same, it's just a transfer of ownership. Well, let's just take, let's, let's push this back into Anglicanism. Uh, uh, recently, Anglican Inc. ran a story about the Church of Nigeria in the Igbo uh, Nigerian inheritance laws. Mm -hmm. There's the federal law, and then there's local customary law. In the Igbo uh, people, which uh, uh, I don't want to be too specific because I forgot where they are in Nigeria. I think they're in the southeast. Uh, the custom is that uh, when a man dies, his property goes back to it only goes to another man either right. his son or his brother or his father it doesn't go to the wife the wife is not allowed inheritance rights under a good traditional law well the federal nigerian uh, governments uh, if there's no will if there's no will directing where the money goes it automatically goes to the next male of kin cutting out daughters and a wife uh, the, the Church of Nigeria supported a campaign to change that law to allow daughters to equal in, to inherit equally as sons, um, upending traditional tribal customs. That's the same sort of issue we're talking about with uh, allowing, uh, you know, in England, the uh, example, Michael Nazar Ali put out an example a few years ago about civil unions. Why can't two elderly sisters with no other living relatives uh, who live together and share a home be treated as a civil partnership mm -hmm. for inheritance and tax purposes so that if one dies, the other is not forced to sell the home to pay the inheritance duties, but can have the same rights as a spouse? Um, and well, the argument is no, well, no, it can only be uh, someone other than a blood relative and this and that. Um, but the issue was, you know, don't change the definition of marriage. Change the civil laws that rely upon the term of marriage. And this is what the Nigerians have done uh, with uh, inheritance in that particular issue. There are ways to do this, and there are ways to do it justly and lawfully. If you have, uh, I believe you should be able to do whatever you want with, with your assets and not have the government favor one way of doing it over another unless there's a bona fide uh, reason. I mean, if, if you want to leave all your money to Antifa to, and with the will codicil to blow up the world, I don't think that's a good thing. No. But, but I think people understand where I'm going with this. There should well, be the liberty of conscience in what you do with your things and not have the government penalize you. One of the things my mom did was she set up a, a trust, the Coulson Trust. And it's a way to get around uh, some of these strange laws because she lived in multiple states over time. She had assets in those states. And the only solution a lawyer could come up with was, well, the laws are working against you, but if we set up a, a trust for you in a state you previously lived in, you can't set up this trust in this state that you're living now, but if you did it in a previously state where your dad actually owned a farm, we can work around all these crazy laws that are trying to take all your money. And she was able to do that. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> They'll probably pass a law taking away that estate. But that's just, you know, that's the craziness of the tax laws. The laws are the problem. Uh, not uh, We don't need to create these uh, fake relationships to uh, change the law, George. Yeah, and for the church to adopt its policies to make people happy, mm -hmm based upon faulty or illogical or unjust civil laws to change its eternal teachings on that basis, I think is a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. All right, George, we've come up here on about uh, 30 minutes, which is awesome. Our audience wants more, but we can't give it to them on Friday because, well, I'm repositioning the RV to a Cracker Barrel tonight. Oh, boy. What's for dinner? Uh -huh. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 626 of Anglican Unscripted.